All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started again. Today's is more of a basic. We're going to ease into this. Some of this may be very elementary to you all, but uh, it's, it's just keeps setting the stage for what we started with yesterday and how we're going to end up with, uh, with tomorrow's program. Um, we have lots of good, well, we're getting less and less vegetable people, but uh, due to retirements and non-replacements, but we have a lot of good vegetable researchers and extension folks throughout the United States, but we really have one here in the Great Lakes region. It's called the Great Lakes Vegetable Working Group, and you know, if we don't have it in Ohio, somebody from that group can usually provide us the research-based information to help with answering questions or helping you guys get information, and we utilize that group pretty heavily. Judd Reed is a, was a key member and still is a key member of the Great Lakes Vegetable Working Group, and he put a very good basic introduction to pest management uh, presentation together, and Judd said we could use this for this training because he used it to a, for a similar training he did out there in New York. So Judd prepared this. Uh, there's some research-based information results that he shared that they did in New York. I don't know all the details, but pretty well it's self-explanatory when you go to uh, see the results they did, especially on some of the pest management techniques they're using in tunnels there. So I want to thank Judd for letting us use this for, for this week's training. But integrated pest management for high tunnels, we heard, I think every farmer said something yesterday about pest management and how they go about managing those pests in their high tunnel situations. Uh, we've talked about some of it already this morning, but it comes down to cultural practices that you use. And why, is, why did Eric put up that great big 23-foot tall tunnel? Cultural practices again, environmental management. That's going to help him do a better job of raising those crops and controlling the uh, environment by making it, uh, you know, keeping the temperatures and the humidity more in check, which will help with prevention of any pest or disease outbreaks he may have out there. We heard from Terry Zimmerman yesterday, sanitation. They use the wooden stakes still, but every year buy brand new wooden stakes for their high tunnel tomatoes. Now they do chlorinate them. He told us about the process he uses to clean those stakes. And, um, but again, it comes down to that sanitation. Um, he was even maybe concerned that he was moving some virus around in those peppers with some of the tools they were using down in the pepper canopy and some of his hands, you know, moving the, working the crop through, uh, throughout the, with his boy's hands that were down there working. But sanitation is very important. Very simple way just to be good. <laughs> Exclusion is another one. Keeping those pests out. We haven't done a lot of work here in Ohio on using nettings and different pest exclusion techniques. Down in Arkansas they are in the southern states. They're using a lot more where we actually put netting on the edges of the, of the high tunnels and around the sides and on the roll-up sides just to keep those insect pests from coming in. But that's an, if we can keep the pest out of those tunnels, reduce those aphids from getting in there, watch those spider mites, or even catch them when they're in the low populations rather than after they've exploded, that all helps with uh, integrated pest management in the tunnels. Don't forget plant resistance. We heard a lot of folks yesterday talking about there's a market for heirloom tomatoes. Well, with the heirloom vegetables, that's why they're heirlooms. They've been around 100 years or so, and they just don't have the disease resistance and the tolerance built, bred into them. But there's a lot of good varieties out there today. I do have some catalogs that were left over from another workshop. Uh, Terry was mentioning about Mountain Fresh and some of the varieties they were using. This is a, a, a catalog from Harris Seeds. Um, they, they had some they gave us for another conference, and they have some of those same varieties that they were mentioning yesterday. So you can pick those up if you want, but just take a look in those t uh, seed catalogs and look at some of the resistance that's bred into a lot of these varieties. If we can get a downy, mildew-tolerant cucurbit variety, why do we want to keep banging our heads against the wall trying to beat and battle downy mildew when we can select a variety that maybe had a little bit more resistance or tolerance? Um, if we're having bacterial issues with our peppers, why not raise a variety that has bacterial spot uh, resistance where we don't have to be battling that disease? So choose the plant resistance when you can. It's going to make life a heck of a lot easier once you get into production. There's a lot of beneficial insects out there. We really didn't get in on the field tours yesterday, but in Ohio, if you look at a vegetable production guide. It might have our, our, our Great Lakes vegetable production guide or Midwest vegetable production guide has a listing and I'll bring a copy, we'll show everybody that. That's for field vegetables but it has fungicides listed for different diseases, insecticides listed for different diseases. As a high tunnel grower you need to really look at the labels on those chemicals. In Ohio 
if it says on the label not for use in enclosed structures or greenhouse, then we cannot use those chemicals and those uh, pesticides in the high tunnel. If there's a, doesn't mention it, that's called a silent label according to Ohio Department of Agriculture. And as of just a month ago, that's how they were still interpreting the law here in Ohio. If it says, does not mention not for use in high tunnels or enclosed structures, that gives us as farmers the, the opportunity that we could choose that as a, uh, as a chemical of choice that we could use for a pest management program. Um, but read those labels. Remember, a lot of these chemicals act a little different when we throw them inside those tunnels. We've, we learned yesterday just the environmental conditions are a lot different. And uh, Just be careful. Read the labels. I don't know how West Virginia handles those uh, high tunnel labels, do us, but uh, about the same way? Okay, using the silent label. So, but we don't really have to use it. I didn't hear a whole lot yesterday about chemical usage. Did anybody really say a lot about chemical usage? Because of our controlled environment, we can eliminate a lot of the diseases, and if we do have some pests, yeah. The one fellow, uh, he talked about they went and bought a new sprayer. New sprayer, just to be safe. Oh, what's the sprayer? Um, we'll get into that, but like uh, aphids. If he had an aphid outbreak, he could use insecticidal soap. There's a lot of these OMRI organic approved control measures, and that's about when most of them, that, for me being on the farms, that they're using. If you can get a soap application in there real quick on these soft-bodied insects, that can pretty well take care of them. But I can tell you almost all those growers, if it come down to losing the crop, they will go ahead and, and look at the labels and find what product of choice they can use. But there's a lot of these, even you know, the organic control measures, as well as these beneficials. Uh, Dr. Mary Gardner, she's one of the entomologists that I work closely with. Her and her staff have done a lot of work on, and we've been one site where they go out in the fields and they're looking at the beneficial insects that are out there. Beneficial insects are the good bugs that eat the bad bugs. In a high tunnel, they work great because we're managing that environment. We don't have to worry about birds coming in and eating the ladybugs or other stuff. Like that. you know, they're inside that tunnel. If we can just manage the beneficial insects in our tunnels. We can actually introduce them. If we introduce them early enough, we can actually control a lot of these insect issues that are in the, mainly for insects, but we can work with, a, with those beneficial insects to help us with controlling the pests within the high tunnels. Um, there's some predators, beneficial predators that'll come in and they can either be specialists, they're only gonna eat one certain type of an insect, or they can be generous. They just go ahead and eat a lot of different types of bad bugs that are in our high tunnels. We got parasitoids that will actually go in and lay their egg into you know, different wasps, parasitic wasps that'll go in and lay their eggs in a, in a uh, tomato fruit worm, for instance, and then you'll see all these little eggs starting to come out of that fruit worm and ends up killing that, uh, killing that insect just from those uh, parasitoid actions. And then Matt's gonna cover this a little more tomorrow, but grafting. Grafting has shown, especially on soil-borne disease organisms, that can help us uh, produce that crop within the high tunnel just by using a rootstock that's more resistant or tolerant to some of the different soil-borne diseases that we might be finding. By gra using a grafted plant, you still got the scion on the top part is the fruit we're wanting. You know, Terry was saying how they love that Mountain Fresh variety. But if they had some disease issues that Mountain Fresh couldn't cope with, we could put Mountain Fresh on top of a, a different type of rootstock that's resistant or tolerant to some of the soil-borne diseases and we still get the same fruit, but it's got the resistance of that, uh, of that rootstock. So we'll go into grafting. Matt's going to cover that more in depth tomorrow. And then at the bottom of the list, because we always want to, you know, we don't want to spray and pray. Those days are long gone. My grandpa, you know, he, back 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, it was a spray and pray thing for a lot of our... Uh, vegetable growers. But today, if we don't have to use them, one, they're so expensive today. Chemicals back when Grandpa was farming tomatoes and pickles and cabbage, it was cheap. You know, chemicals were really cheap. It was easier just to spray every seven days. But today, if we don't have to, we can save ourselves a lot of money by just eliminating that spray uh, program within our high tunnels. And I was mentioned yesterday, tunnel production is not greenhouse production. And it's not field production, it's a, it's a combination of the two. So you really can't take the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, which is a totally, for the most part, field production guide, use all those practices in there, and we can't go to uh, 
a big greenhouse production manual that just goes on totally enclosed, very environmentally controlled conditions. We're talking two different situations here that are a combination of, the, of two greenhouse as well as field production. Matt pointed out yesterday when we were down at the Weber's, it was pouring down rain. We couldn't hear each other very good because because uh, it was raining so much. But that rain is uh, is what helps with well, eliminating that rain is what helps us with high tunnel production. But it can favor thrips. It can it can favor spider mites. Those if it can keep we want it dry in there. But if we keep it dry, then those conditions are really great for the buildup of thrips and mites. We used the terms yesterday, passive heating, passive cooling. That's where we're using the environment. We're actually managing those. We're rolling up the sides with the pipe wrench or whatever it takes. But because of the uh, passive ventilation, roll up these sides. That allows us all them bugs to come flying in from the fields and everywhere else and can enter that greenhouse. So I, I'm thinking maybe the future will be looking at more netting. When I went to Israel back in 2008, lots of high tunnel production in Israel. But they had adopted netting technology on everything. They don't want the aphids in there. They didn't want the thrips getting in there. They didn't want the, the bad bugs coming from all those desert vegetables to get inside their, uh, their high tunnels. So I think we can possibly in the future be looking at using and adopting and researching some of them netting techniques to, to be used here in the, in the Midwest. But as of now, it's not an ado adopted practice for our growers. So. When you roll up those sides or open up those end walls, that can allow those pests to come on into the structure. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, what thrips are? That's a picture. They're really hard to see. Um, you almost have to have a magnifying glass or a, or a small, uh, small uh, microscope to even look at them. But you can see the damage before you can really even see the thrips. They're just a little tiny, uh, almost white color, very not not distinguishable color to them. It's hard to see. Uh, wide host range. They get on cucumbers, they get on tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, cabbage, just about everything. You get thrips in cabbage, uh, especially if you're growing for the processing market. Or we got a cabbage incorporated up in Cleveland that sells to most all the Kentucky fried chickens. I've had some farmers that are growing cabbage for that cabbage incorporated and they find thrips in there. The whole load is rejected. And they'll get down in the different leaves. Uh, they'll get down in the heart of that of that uh, cabbage head, you can't get rid of it. And they cannot use that cabbage for coleslaw if it's got thrips in it and it's got the thrips damage in it. That's how critical this uh, is. I think we heard yesterday uh, from the Zimmermans, there was, uh, they've been having some virus problems. I don't think they had it quite figured out what was causing those virus issues, but thrips can be one of them. If we get thrips on our transplants or if the thrips happen to come in later, um, they can spread that virus. And once we get that virus in that plant, there's no getting rid of it. You know, we can ward off viruses to an extent. Some of them stick around in our bodies for a while. But when you, these plants get the virus, it's not going to go away and you're pretty well stunned. What did uh, Eric tell us? Some of their pepper plants, one year they got infected at bloom and when they were in the middle of the season, affected his yield, his quality, but he still was able to harvest a crop. And then one year they got virus infection on those uh, pepper plants when they were, what did he say, this big? I think he said never did come out of it. They had to find some new plants and replant them. So that's how important it is to control thrips when it comes to either the transplant stage all the way through to the production stage. Um, when you do have thrips on your plants, it gives you some pretty distinguishable characteristics that you can at least start getting that magnifying glass in there and looking and see if you got them. Yellow flecking, black dots, those are some of the some of the things that'll pop up on that plant if there are thrips in there working that plant. But they're most often found on the underside of the leaves and inside flowers. Uh, we talked yesterday going up and down through the rows every morning to pollinate your tomatoes. And I know I don't, I don't like to bend over either because this you you were talking about losing weight. I mean that's what I need to try to lose some weight too. But you need to bend over and get down underneath those leaves and look under, on the underside of the leaves. It's easy just to walk through and look down, but like these critters, they're going to be on the underside of the leaves. And if we're not trapping, if we don't have sticky traps and we're not looking, they can be under there and the top of the leaf looks fine. And by the time we see the symptoms, they might have already in, infected that plant with that virus. Two spotted spider mites, more in dry conditions. In drought years, we'll see this pest pop up out in the fields. 
in the tunnels, we're wanting it dry in there to keep the diseases out. So spotted, uh, two-spotted spotter might can pop up just about any time inside the tunnel just because we don't have no rainfall. The best control for spider mites is what's happening today and yesterday. A good old rainfall will just wash those spider mites off the leaves and drown them out. We don't have that in a tunnel because we're not overhead irrigating and we're not watering. So um, they're not really an insect, but they are an arachnid because of all those uh, legs they got on them. They love the hot, dry conditions. Just what we're doing inside the tunnels helps with disease control, but it's not good for spider mites. Uh, they love them. They love the, the conditions in there. They can overwinter inside the high tunnels, especially if you're doing some of these uh, winter crops, keeping a little warm in there. Uh, frips can overwinter, aphids can overwinter. That's one thing with tunnels, they don't cool down. We don't get the minus 20 degrees. Usually we don't get them inside the tunnels, but that also is a great place to harbor those insects over the winter. So if we did have some issues, they can overwinter in those tunnels, come right back to get us here at this time of the year. And there's many hosts. These things get on soybeans, they can get on cucumbers, they can get on pumpkins, they can get on melons, tomatoes. Such a wide host range for the two-spotted spider mite. Typical injury on a cucumber leaf. When they start getting to this, it's, this is loaded with spider mites. And what they do, they're sucking the sap right out of that plant. That plant's really stressed out when you have a high enough population that's starting to cause. See how this curling of the leaves? Um, if we were to, a good way that I test, if I don't have my hand lens, I just take a white piece of paper like this. And if I'm suspecting there could be spider mites, I'm in the field or in the tunnel, I just want to do a quick test, I'd take this leaf, smash it on this piece of paper, look at it, you'll see a bunch of red dots on it. That's the red spider mite, you just squished them on there and there's all these red dots. That's a pretty quick test for spider mites if you don't have the hand lens, you don't want to get to a to a lab, you don't want to send it off somewhere. Just If you're suspecting and it's hot and dry, then that's a quick way to do a quick test for, uh, for spider mites. And that last picture you saw, mm -hmm. the bumps on there, those are the spider mites? Yeah, yeah. I think on that. On the top of the leaf there? Um, they could be all over the leaf eventually. They usually start at the bottom side, but those actually look like aphids. But, so, but this injury is, uh, is typical spider mite injury too. There's some. Yeah, those look like aphids on there too, but that would be typical. Uh, that could be both spider mites and aphid damage on there. Um, aphids, because of our conditions, again, it, we, don't, uh, we don't have the rains that are washing them off. We've just got great conditions, and the life cycle of aphid is so fast that the population can just explode inside our high tunnel if we're not watching it. Um, there's lots of species. They can come in from other, other surrounding fields. That's another thing. We want to keep these tunnels as clean around them. Just about everybody's. It was pretty clean yesterday all around their tunnels. No weed patches, no high grass, because all those areas could harbor any of these pests. So we want to keep those areas all around the tunnels nice and either mowed down or just free of weeds. I mean, at Zimmerman's place, it was pretty well all just nothing at, the, at Terry's house, just no, no grass, nothing in between them. Um, but if we get, there's lots of different species and come in from lots of different crops. Um, pretty easy to ID, uh, pretty easy to control if you get them early enough. There's this soft-bodied insect that just an insecticidal soap applicator. I love to watch after I've sprayed aphids with insecticidal soap under a microscope. They just melt down. And the fatty acids in that soap just destroy that, and they literally melt. That's why they're so easy to control. We can just take that a simple soap application, but if we don't catch it early enough, say we weren't watching our tunnel or we got busy picking sweet corn and we didn't get into the tunnel every few days to check things out or we sent the boys in and they just ran through it and didn't really look very good you can get to the point that even a soap application is not going to help you so you can keep your costs down you can keep a good control program if you catch it early enough with some of these softer types of types of chemicals like i said there's lots of hosts out there that the aphids can come in on everything out landscape field crops everything can be uh, can be a host for aphids. And they do produce. What is the life cycle of a aphid, Lewis? It can be pretty quick under right conditions. What do you think, Jim? It can oh, be... You know, almost a week. Oh, yeah. yeah. What aphids do is they don't lay eggs. They lay other aphids. Mm. And so that's why the generations... So much faster. Yeah. So they can just literally explode overnight on us if we don't watch them. Other types of pests, a tomato fruit worm, they do actually get themselves in can be an issue out in the fields, but they can actually, that moth can fly into the, uh, 
into the tunnel as well and, uh, and start causing some problems on our tomato fruit in the greenhouse. Tomato hornworm can be another issue. That moth just flies in there. Again, I'm thinking maybe we need to look at some exclusion work sometimes. When we can keep these moths that lay the eggs that start these life cycles from getting into the tunnel, then we shouldn't have as much of an issue with them. But for right now, I've seen it. The moths fly in and then we start having the, having the issues with these different types of pests. Uh, cutworms can also be a problem, just like we have in the field. White flies, we hear our bedding plant producers and our poinsettia producers especially always are having issues with white fly uh, in their poinsettias. We can get white flies because we've got similar type of growing conditions as, a, as the poinsettia growers inside our high tunnels. There's other types of mites as well. We've got the russet mite, the broad mite that can also be issues uh, inside our high tunnel. Cucumber beetles can get in there. They can fly on in and cucumber beetles transmit uh, bacterial wilt. So if they're feeding on our cucumber plants, they ingest that bacterium, uh, gets into that plant, then you get a heavy fruit load on there and your plant starts wilting down, you wonder what's going on. Well, probably could have been that cucumber beetle got in there 20 days, 15 days, 30 days before ingested that bacterium. That bacterium finally grew to the point that it's plugging up the vascular system of the plant we start seeing the wilting and eventually collapse of that cucumber plant. Not a big issue, but you can get, because we're growing in the ground. We don't have concrete, we're growing in the ground. We could have ant issues inside the tunnels. Not too bad, but every once in a while, I get a farmer that has some high ant populations, that, and they're just the same as we have them out in the field, but they're more protected. You know, out in the field you can get possums and coons and everything else tearing up those ant hills, but in the tunnel we don't. So they're, if they get started in there and we don't happen to catch them, they can be an issue as well. Some of the cultural control practices we need to do for our IPM program inside the high tunnel, again, sanitation, physical exclusion. Talk a lot about pruning yesterday. Didn't we? Was that a common denominator of everybody on the tomato tunnels was how they prune? A little different between everybody, but for the most part, everybody was pruning just to try to facilitate that air movement within that plant canopy, try to ward off some of the disease, um, just to help keep that, keep that plant a little bit drier. Uh, keeping our temperatures in check. I think uh, we caught Terry a little off guard. I think we got there and that one first tun tunnel was pretty warm, pretty humid in there. Did you see the boys all jumped to it when Dad said start dropping those sides and start opening up the doors. But if we can control that temperature both on the both extremes from cold or warm, uh, not being too warm, not being too cold, uh, that's going to help us with controlling the pests and diseases in our tunnels. And like Matt said yesterday, just by having that tunnel over top of us, we were able to eliminate a lot of that plant moisture, which eliminates that plant disease triangle. You gotta have moisture, gotta have the disease, gotta have the heat. With the tunnel, we keep those leaves drier. We can break that disease triangle. A lot of our fungal pathogens, our fungal diseases, we can break that cycle before they even get started just by controlling that moisture. Sanitation also includes weed control. Um, some of you are building your tunnels now. I would highly suggest this simple landscape fabric down around your ground post. It, it may not seem it's going to be an issue now, but believe me, controlling the weeds right along that edge, along those ground posts, around those, uh, those baseboards is a real bear. So if you could just use the landscape fabric, put it down before you go start uh, putting your baseboards down and putting your ground post in, that's going to save you a lot of time. You, a little piece of grass grow up in between there and those, that grass can harbor aphids, can bring in a lot of other insects. So just preparing in advance and trying to make life a little easier. It's going to be hard enough being a high tunnel grower. Uh, if you can do little simple tricks like this, uh, that's going to help us prevent the weeds, which can harbor the mites, can harbor the thrips, can harbor the aphids. And just like what uh, Fred Weaver was having problems with, with that old tunnel, excess water. If you have to build that field up, put that tunnel on the highest point you can. I forget, Matt, how much water comes off a 30 by 96 tunnel when we have a one inch rain, but we're talking thousands of gallons of water can run off of that tunnel with a one inch rain. You don't want that water going into the tunnel. We want to shed that water off. So we want to put that and build that tunnel at the highest point we can. We want to use the dozer to bring it in and grade that up a little bit and build that tunnel at a little higher point than the surrounding ground. Um, but if we can just keep that 
tunnel dry, we're going to prevent a lot of other issues as well, including the insects, shore flies, fungus gnats, these things just multiply so quickly. It seems like once you get them, you just can't. Even if you dry things out, they still get down under the mulch and they still continue to reproduce down in there. Not a good thing. We do not want to mix. Did you have a question? Yeah. Has anybody been ever used animal control inside the tunnel? Um, from experience again, that's what Matt and I can, we've done everything wrong. So you got, you got good people that are tell you, that's what we do. We do things and make the mistakes for you don't have to because it'll cost you money and family and everything else to, uh, you know, make mistakes. But we make the mistakes and right out, the tunnel's not, that was one of those movable ones that blew away the third time we finally had to trash it, but had strawberries in it. And one weekend it got warm, rolled the sides up on Friday afternoon before we went to, uh, went home for the weekend. That was before we had the big deer fence and we had the roll-up sides and you'd think 40, ooh, did I do something? 42 inches or whatever the roll-up sides were, you'd think a deer couldn't get in there. Well, we come back on Monday morning, there wasn't a strawberry left in that tunnel. A deer, we could tell, we knew it was a deer because there was a big set of prints and it was with its baby, its mama, little tiny prints. They both got in there and most of them was tromping around all weekend. Uh, eating all of our strawberries. So now, whenever we do that, we do for crops that are susceptible to deer damage, uh, we suggest putting in just that simple uh, black poly fence right on your roll up sides there to keep those deer. Once we did that, then we never had the issue again. Now we put in the big deer fence, so we really don't have no problems out in the research plots I mean, anymore. Intentional, like guineas or something? Oh, using those, like weed or grease or guineas or something inside the tunnel? Anybody doing that? I'm, I, I don't know anybody using those types of... Uh, we had guineas for a while and they picked up strawberries. Did they? Yeah. Okay, they, they said they've had guineas before and they actually pecked the strawberries and we're, we're making holes in strawberries. But maybe something to look at. I'm not sure. But yeah, I thought you were talking the other way. Yeah, the wildlife coming in and putting exclusion fences up there. Do not mix your ornamentals with your vegetable crops. In these types of petunias, see all these nice beautiful colors? Some of those intentionally have virus in them just to make them look pretty. The breeders want that in there to give them all these different colorations. Do we want that going down our tomatoes? What if we had an aphid or a thrip or something go up here, feed on these petunias, and then go fly down into our tomato canopy? Spread that virus in the tomatoes. Do not mix your ornamental plants with your vegetable crops. If you are a diversified grower and you do both ornamental plants and vegetable crops, Separate greenhouse. Have a totally separate greenhouse. If the Zimmermans were still in bedding plants, I never seen bedding plants within the same vegetable house when they were growing their vegetables and bedding plants. So, um, easy way just to prevent a lot of issues with our with our vegetable crops. And we're after here to make some money. Put the petunias all in another another petunia house. Uh, mulch helps prevent mite mite problems. Helps keeps things drier down through there. This is uh, one of uh, Judd Reed's pepper trials he's got. And really, you see, let's see who had the straw? Does Zimmerman's have some straw in there yesterday? They've gotten away from some of the straw just because of the high price of it, but they still bale a lot of their straw and put down in between the rows. Um, here's some work that Judd's doing in New York on using the insect exclusion screening, which I'd like to see us do a little bit more of here in Ohio. Now, it doesn't help when you have your end walls open, but I'm sure you just open that up for ventilation or something. But you would have this insect screening then all the way down to the bottom of the ground on your roll-up sides, and then you'd have it on your, uh, on your end walls. Um, pretty common in the greenhouse industry with our bedding plant producers and even our hydroponic vegetable producers use a lot of insect screen. We got one uh, hydroponic vegetable grower up in Leesburg, Ohio, that um, their, whole, their whole house, they actually on their end walls have another little area, a walk-through area, that's double screened. So when they walk in the door, they have a, another door they gotta go, but that first set of doors is within a screened-in porch type of an area. So why we haven't adopted this in high tunnels, I, you know, I'm not quite sure, but I think we're getting there and we're slowly looking at more insect screening for our high tunnels. Uh, pruning, just to feel, it can be a jungle in there. If we don't do a good job pruning, these are indeterminate varieties, like we were saying yesterday, they will go to the peak if you let them. And it can be a jungle in there. You have to keep that well and pruned out, especially on indeterminate varieties. And um, like they said yesterday, most of the determinants, they're going up to the one just right below that first flower cluster to get them pruned out. 
Um, plant resistance, uh, selecting your varieties that are going to give us the disease and the insect resistant intolerance that may, we may want to have when it comes to um, producing our high tunnel crops. However, as we hybridize these plants, we lose some of the traits. You may lose a little bit on taste, you may lose a little bit on looks. That's why they're still interested in the heirloom varieties. The heirloom varieties give us good taste. They, they still got some good looks for some markets, but they might be less in this uh, disease resistance or insect resistance intolerance. So just keep that in mind as you look through the seed catalogs. You're going to see some that um, have a full-blown disease package, but may not meet the market standards that you guys are all wanting to sell to. Um, some varieties are more tolerant. We have tolerance and resistance. Pretty big uh, dif differentiation between those two names. Resistance means they will not get it. They are resistant to that pathogen, whatever. But then we have cucurbit varieties that are tolerant to powdery mildew. They still will get it, but they won't get it as bad. Uh, you might be able to reduce your, insect your fungicide applications in half growing a powdery mildew tolerant cucurbit variety compared to one that is not tolerant to powdery mildew. Um, so there is a difference between tolerance and resistance. Just keep that in mind as you're making your seed selections. Um, some of the researchers have shown that uh, striped cucumber beetle are less attracted to plants with low levels of cucurbitaceae, and that's the, that's the smell that really gets cucumber beetles excited and brings them on in. Uh, Celeste Welty is our entomologist that works with all of us uh, fruit and vegetable folks, and she actually puts crops like buffalo gourd around a pickle field. We had a big 80 acre pickle field right up here in Ross County a few years ago and we were doing some tests to see if we could place these I do believe it was buffalo gourd or some type of a high cucurbitaceae type crop all around the uh, perimeter of that field and if that would be a good attractant crop for cucumber beetles. Not only in that big field we weren't looking at it to control that pest but more for a scouting pest because that cucumber beetle as they emerge will go to those buffalo gourd type variety uh, cucurbits before they'll hit the pickles. And it worked. We, were, we would test, we would go out and, and check those traps all around the perimeter of that field every couple of days and sure enough they showed up in those uh, trap crops first before they made their way into the into the pickle field. But these non-bitter types, most of our um, seedless varieties will be, will have that type of a trait to them that'll be less than, this is one variety I've never grown, I don't know if Lewis has grown this one or not, but uh, Judd has raised this one in New York and it seems to be uh, less attractive to the cucumber beetle, which then helps us control the bacterial wilt issues that we have in our cucurbits. Uh, just sharing some of uh, Judd's research that he's done, I think they've learned a lot of good things in New York just to back up what what we're saying here, but he tested a couple varieties of high tunnel tomatoes, Trust and Boa, and was looking at them for two-spotted spider mite susceptibility. Trust, you can see, ended up having quite a bit of uh, mite damage on them, where the variety Boa just wasn't, uh, had a little bit, but not near the damage, and must not have been near as attractive to the spider mites as the, as the Trust variety. Um, we got to get going here a little bit. Some biological and control treatments we can use um, in our high tunnels. Beneficial insects, we already talked about that, the predators, the specialists versus the generalists, uh, the parasitoids. Um, we can take a lot of the research if it's been done in greenhouse settings and transfer that for the most part into our high tunnel technologies and our high tunnel production. Um, and there's been a lot of other folks that have done a lot of biological work in, in high tunnels as well. But it takes time to work. Don't think you're going to be able to slack on your scouting procedures and have a great big infestation take place and then think these, these good bugs or the biologicals are going to come in and control it for us. We've got to catch it in the early stages of that, uh, of that pest buildup, not after it's, uh, not after it's already built up to a population that these, even the biologicals won't be able to control it. And it's almost used as a preventive measurement. You know, we're going to release and we're going to build up the lady beetle populations in that tunnel um, early on for they're ready to go when the aphids, uh, aphids start to accelerate in our... Um, but the, I think the key to using any of the biologicals is, is a more of a preventative, where unlike insecticides, we don't really want to use, and if we don't have to, insecticides as a preventative. We want to use them when the conditions warrant. We've built up our threshold levels to make that application. 
with biologicals, we want to encourage that development, that buildup, that population of these biological controls and these beneficial insects prior to having an issue in the high tunnel. A um, couple reasons why biologic control works. It, it really, in Ohio, it's tough to use biologic control out in our fields. We just have too many storms and too many birds and too many things that can mess us up. It's, it's being done, but it can be done a lot better and easier in the tunnels because we have this controlled environment. You know, you get lady beetles coming in. Right now, we got some lady beetles. You know, last fall they started coming into the house. We got an old farmhouse. They're coming in the house now. The boys know to get the shop vac, shop vac them all up, take them out into the tunnels and just scatter them all out there. To buy those ladybugs gets pretty expensive. If we do buy ladybugs from out west, they're probably not going to work too well here under our conditions. We want to use the species and, that are used to growing here. More than likely, uh, there's been some experiences where the growers have bought beneficials from other countries, other states. They just don't really do too well here. They're not used to our conditions, but if we can take lady beetles that are coming into our house anyway, or we can collect in the wild and, and encourage their development and bring them into our tunnels, that's going to help with, uh, with them having that population there when that insect that they need to control is there. If we do mix pesticides with the, the beneficial insects, we need to beware. Um, like I said earlier, a lot of pesticides don't fit well within these settings. They're either not labeled, or they don't work, or if we go and put a pesticide in, we've just wiped out our lady beetles, or we've wiped out our lace wings, or we've wiped out the good bugs that are helping us control the bad bugs. Um, other things, learn from experience again. Even though we weren't cropping this tunnel, Brad had this great idea. He was going to go and put... Uh, put the Roundup right around that outside. That was in his early days before he used the landscape fabric and just spray a little Roundup around the outside to control the weeds. That Roundup can make its way into the tunnel, will not degrade under those tunnel conditions. Just different environment, the chemicals will not react the same. Roundup can hang around and hang around and hang around a tunnel for a long time. Even if you don't smell it, don't sense it, those tomato plants will. Um, so when we use pesticides, even herbicides just around the outside, they do not degrade like they do out in the field. They're just, they've been tested under totally different conditions than what we have going on in the tunnels. So um, the de de degradation, degradation of these uh, pesticides has not been well researched in the high tunnel situation. We do have some short harvest intervals. And if you ever look at a chemical, it has PHI, the pre-harvest interval. That's more than likely under outside conditions, especially if it doesn't have a high ton or a greenhouse label. Just think of us, if we're just putting this on in the tunnel, we're not getting rainfall on it, we're not getting the environmental to conditions to, uh, to wash it off our fruit, we can have some high residues on there if we've used something that's not labeled for use in the, uh, in the tunnel. And like I mentioned earlier, some field materials, insecticides, fungicides, bactericides, will say right on the label, not for use in enclosed structure, and high tunnels would be considered an enclosed structure. So just keep that all in mind. Um, why another reason is used by they work when you rest. Biologicals, ladybugs are eating aphids all the time, day and night. They're always working. Um, thousands of workers out there working for us in the high tunnels. Um, comes right down to it, just shaking a few lady beetles or lace wings uh, throughout the tunnel is going to be a lot less labor than repeated applications of insecticidal soaps, oils, other control measures for insects. They don't burn the plants. You know, oils may be a, an OMRI approved product, but you can actually get some, I've seen some major damage in high tunnel situations where oils or even high concentration of soaps were used in the tunnel and then we get these hot conditions with this, this intense sunlight in there, we can get some burning going on in the plants. Biologicals, they won't burn the plants. No re-entry interval. If we do have insecticides that are labeled in the high tunnel or the greenhouse situation, REI, re-entry interval, could be more than likely the minimum is 24 hours. So by the time you would make an application of an insecticide, it's going to be 24 hours before you can ever walk back into that tunnel. That's a, and every chemical has its own different re-entry interval why you need to read the label again. But 
I don't see too many that are less than 24 hours from application. With biologicals, there are no re-entry intervals. No pre-harvest intervals. The PHI, the number of days you need to wait between an application of an insecticide and then one you can uh, harvest. With biologicals, we don't have a pre-harvest interval. And they work. The research pretty well throughout the world has shown biological control does work in the greenhouse and high tunnels. This is where it comes, this is a hydroponic operation, um, but they've been using beneficials pretty standard in this industry for a very long time. Uh, just got about five minutes left. Uh, we talked a lot about yesterday about environmental management. Um, the most aggressive beneficial insects need specific temperatures and relative humidities. So again, we need to control that uh, not only for our growing conditions, but for our biologicals. Uh, high tunnels, we talked about yesterday, have high uh, wide uh, swings in temperature and relative humidity. Remember the, uh, the church uh, scenario I was telling you about? You go to, go to church in the morning, it's cool, it's cloudy, cold in there, you keep your sides down, keep the, uh, keep the uh, doors shut, and then you're sitting in church and around 10.30, the sun comes out like it's trying to do here now, and it starts spiking inside that tunnel from a nice uh, 60, 70 degrees up to 100 and some degrees, somebody needs to be there. And Julie Weber, she says she's the one that's home more and she's the one that's in charge of when those conditions change to be there and manage those conditions real fast. And it's because of these wide swings we have. With Eric's big tall tunnel, that's why he made it so tall. He don't have these, these swings that, uh, that we usually go with these lower tunnels. Um, but this environmental management requires selecting less sensitive beneficials, repeat releases, creating habitat, doing everything we can do to encourage the beneficial insects within our, with our plantings. Um, it's very important to ID that aphid species. Um, certain beneficial insects, and you have a list. Uh, let me, by uh, um, Dr. Mary Gardner, I mentioned earlier, she put together this really nice sheet. I think Jim might have been, uh, yeah, Jim, Jim published this as well, and Celeste Wellity did. Uh, ben Phillips, Chelsea Smith, real nice guy. You can actually keep this out in the greenhouse. It's made out of material that it won't get wet. And, uh, but that gives you some uh, good natural enemies and beneficial insects that we'd like to encourage. And on each one of those is an explanation of what pests that those, uh, those different uh, beneficial insects go after. So it is important to ID that aphid because certain beneficial insects will only eat certain aphids. You'd hate to release the wrong beneficial insect if you had, to, had a different species of aphid. Um, like here's one for, for uh, peach aphids, there's one for potato aphids, um, there's one for pea aphids. So again, you just need to be able to ID those, uh, those different aphids you're having there. Um, this one's a parasitoid, it lays eggs inside the aphids, those eggs become mummies, and you can actually see the progress on the, on the aphid itself once that uh, parasitoid gets in there. Um, some more data, and we'll fly through this real fast here, but biological control on aphids and high tunnel eggplant. Um, Pyganic is an organic insecticide, works pretty good. He made an application of, our, of Pyganic there, and then we started seeing the uh, number of aphids per leaf uh, increase. So then he released uh, this uh, beneficial insect there. Look at the crash he got. He got some, they did their job. He was watching them. There was none, there was none, there was none. All of a sudden he hit that threshold level, made his release. The number of aphids per leaf uh, went down. He got that population under control and never came back. And that was on a high tunnel eggplant. Um, thrift, thrips control on high tunnel cukes. We can do, we have beneficial insects in that. This is the one that, uh, that Judd likes the best. And you just put them inside those little sacks, hang them up within the plant canopy. Um, this one's a generalist predator, can survive on pollen if prey becomes unavailable, so that means it won't starve to death. They can feed on the pollen of that cucumber plant if they don't have the bad bugs there to keep them, uh, keep them well fed. And the costs on most of these are pretty cost effective for the most part. Um, this was some of his data again where he had thrip numbers starting to, starting to go up on the uh, cucumber plants. And then he, re he released a small population there. Seen it wasn't getting under control, released another one. Seen it wasn't getting under control, released another one. That's when he finally got to the levels that was able to knock those threat numbers down. And then, let's see what that started. He made his first release right around the third, and he finally got the crash in, what, 25th, 26th or so. 
and then you get the population back under control. No insecticides, just using biological uh, control treatments. Um, here's another, just another example of biological control of thrips on cucumbers where he released the, released the predators there. Within a 20-day window, he had that population pretty well under control. Um, we can also control spider mites with biologicals. Uh, again, we've got to watch our environment, and then we've got to select the ones of the pests that we're, want, we're wanting that pest to control. They come in a container like this, mixed in with a bunch of oh, sawdust-type filler, and you just go along and you shake that, uh, make those uh, shaking treatments throughout the canopy of the plant. Pretty easy to, uh, to make. It's always good to make sure the beneficials are alive, so if you can put them under a microscope and just see that there is some life in them because they can get too cold in shipping, they can get too hot in shipping. Some of these jokers out there may be selling you dead, uh, dead beneficials. You never know. So it's always good before you're going to rely on this as an insect treatment, do a little check just to make sure that they are alive uh, before you go ahead and make that treatment. If you have an issue, call the company. They'll usually send you another one pretty quick. Doesn't win every time. Uh, here's, here's one of Judd's bad research things. It just didn't work out, but it's good research to show it doesn't always work. We released this uh, biological control. Something happened, whether it was environmental, whether he wasn't on top of it quick enough, but the uh, spider mites just started really bump, uh, jumping right up there, and he never did get them under control in these greenhouse cukes. Um, there's the aphid damage again on the. Do beneficials pay? at one site for bio, the total biological control bill for his insect treatments on one tunnel, 479 bucks. You can't buy many insecticides out there for $479. Just a little pint or half a pint or a few ounces of some of these insecticides will cost you in excess of $479. Um, so really, his, his research has shown somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of gross returns for a 3,000 square foot tunnel is what his insecticide costs were, using biologicals. Not too bad of a deal. So the lessons that uh, they've learned with uh, beneficial insects, scout often, we've been saying that all along. Have your supplier lined up well in advance. Some of these may not be readily available. Um, or be able to get a hold of that company and get them shipped pretty quick once you find an outbreak. Like these aphids. Like Jim says, the population builds up so quick because they lay aphids. There's no egg process involved. You have to get these by your mail time and everything. You've got to get these beneficials to your place and release pretty darn fast. Know your supplier's delivery schedule. You're probably not going to get them, call them on a late Friday afternoon and get them delivered yet that day. It's probably going to be Monday till they get back around to it. And between Friday and Monday, what can an aphid population do? It can just totally explode in there. So you need to make sure you have some good scouting, good communications with your suppliers well in advance and then get those ordered as soon as you need them. Um, Remember, just looking at Judd's, Judd's research there, the effects of these are not immediate, but give them time. They can only eat so much so fast. It takes them a while to start eating these bad bugs and get that, get that population down. But it, more, for the most part, does work if, you, if you're on top of it in terms of management. But plan ahead, um, especially for these pest-intensive crops, vine crops, tomatoes, berries, eggplants. A lot of insects can get after those, so really be on top of them um, in order to use uh, biological control on those. So in conclusion, um, biological control works well in greenhouses. We think it can work just as well in, uh, in high tunnels. Release them early in the production cycle. Encourage the development and the buildup of these beneficial insects. Pest ID is essential. Um, I've got some uh, common natural enemy live ones here that Celeste Waldes gives us. You guys can take a look at those in between the break here. Um, but be able to ID your beneficial insects, be able to, buy, be able to ID your, your bad bugs you're trying to control. Uh, know the supplier's deadlines, when you need to get those ordered. A couple days, a long weekend can really cause you a lot of problems if you can't get those uh, suppliers in your hands. Remember, high tunnels are not greenhouses, though. They're a little different. I think we stressed a lot of that yesterday. These high swings in temperature, relative humidity. Uh, we got these generalist predators that can help us inside the tunnels. And then repeat releases. It's not going to be usually a one-time deal unless we can get that population to crash real fast. A little more on the organic sprays. Again, look at the OMRI list. But uh, oils, 
work very well. They kill by suffocation of the insect pests. Um, remember, the mites and the thrips, most of our insects are on the underside of the leaf, so you're going to be able to go through with that hand spray and just spray on top. Again, we're going to have to bend over, get down underneath there, make that application before we get the coverage on the underside of the leaves as well. Some of the BTs and truss, those would we use for uh, worm control. Again, organic type Bacillus thuringiensis is the, the big real name for it, but most everybody just calls them BTs. And it's a bacterium that that worm can ingest and it only controls the worms, uh, insects that we're having. Uh, in trust also had good, has good action against thrips. Um, and overhead application is required for some of these tunnel crops. You have to spray it over the top. Um, talked a little bit about the winter greens, how we can actually have the aphids and a lot of our insects. If we're doing this 365 day production, just because it's winter time doesn't mean the insects are going to die off in the greenhouses of the tunnels in the winter. It just, uh, they, it's a haven for them. They still can continue to uh, survive and, and overwinter in these winter green crops. And beneficials, though, are inactive during these cold seasons. So in an unmodified tunnel, the beneficials might not give you the control that you, you typically see in a spring, summer, fall type of a situation. If we do all these, cultural control, resistant plants, introduce and manage for beneficial insects, grafting will go more in depth on tomorrow, and have sprays as part of our IPM toolbox, uh, I think we can be pretty successful, but it, like we said, it does not come without a lot of hard work, does it? It's going to take a lot more management and, and uh, hard work to stay on top of them, but we can do it in the high tunnels.